Howdy everybody. In this video we're going to learn about standing waves. Standing waves are created when waves are traveling back and forth in a confined space. A good example we're going to start with would be a string which is fixed at both ends. So this might be like a guitar string for example. What happens in such a medium is that waves are reflected from one end and they end up interfering with waves traveling in the opposite direction from the other end. So when you pluck a guitar string, waves travel down to the end, and they reflect it back. They interfere with waves which are reflected from the other end. So when we have waves whose wavelength is a correct value, and that's kind of what we're going to spend our time learning about here today, what that correct value would be, you get an interference pattern which is referred to as a standing wave. So, in order to have standing waves, we need to have identical waves moving in opposite directions. And so, like the guitar string, you pluck the string, the waves are identical, they reflect off the opposite ends, and so they're moving in opposite directions. So, if we kind of sketch what those two waves might look like, this is going to be a couple of sketches, so I'm going to put them by, um, draw them by time, let's say time to equal zero. We may have one wave that looks like that, which is traveling to the right, and then we may have a second wave which looks like that, which is traveling to the left. So these are identical waves moving in opposite directions. So the way that I've drawn those two waves right now, they're lined up out of phase. where You have the crest of one wave lined up with the trough of the other wave, which would result in destructive interference. So the resulting wave would simply look like a flat line. So there's the resulting wave. So at that moment in time, those two waves interfere to give you destructive interference. Now a fourth of a period later, the two waves will have moved relative to each other. And they're going to have moved half a wavelength relative to each other. So I'm going to draw the blue wave in about the same spot I did before. And I'm say the red wave has moved relative to it, relative to it one half a wavelength to the left. So now those waves are lined up crest to crest. So we'd say they're in phase and we would get constructive interference. So like the crest of the blue wave and the crest of the red wave are in the same spot this time. Which is going to give me a bigger wave. So my resulting wave is going to look something like that. Add the amplitudes up, get a bigger wave. So the waves are going to oscillate back and forth between the first picture and the second picture. We're going to go from constructive interference to destructive interference to constructive interference. So kind of given the recap, there's our medium. At time t equals zero, my wave's going to be a flat line. At one-fourth period, it's going to be constructive interference. It's going to look like that. At two-fourths, or one-half the period, we're going to be back to destructive interference. And then at three-fourths the period, we'll be back to constructive interference, but just shifted half a wavelength over. And so this pattern is going to keep on repeating over the one time every period for the wave. And we call this pattern, again, a standing wave. So if we took a picture of a string that has a standing wave on it, it would look something like this. And um, you can kind of see that there are two strings in the picture. There's not two strings in the picture. It's just vib um, oscillating and vibrating very, very fast so that in the time it takes to take the picture, the string has moved from the t equals zero to the t equals one quarter period to the t equals one half period to the t equals three quarter period and back again. So this is something that's oscillating very, very quickly. The point on the standing wave where the medium never moves is referred to as a node. The medium, string in this case, is never displaced. The points on the string where there is maximum displacement are referred to as antinodes. And so that point would represent an antinode. Now understand that that's one string that's moving up and down. So the antinode would be that string moving up and down is kind of sort of like that. Um, so there's one anti-node over there, it's just the string moving up and down very, very quickly. So if we count 
the anti-nodes. There's four of them. And if we count the nodes, there are five of them. The ends of the strings we count as nodes because that's where the medium's not moving. So we need to look at a standing wave and identify how many nodes or anti-nodes it has, and then understand how many wavelengths there are and relate that to the length of the string. That's what we're going to do now. So here are some pictures of some standing waves on a string that could be formed. The standing wave is only formed when the length of the string matches a half number of wavelengths. So if we call the distance, um, or length of the string rather, L, L has to be some integer number of half wavelengths. So for example, in the second picture, we kind of sketch um, an outline of it, that would represent one wavelength. And so I could say that lambda equals one wavelength, or L equals one wavelength. The second picture has got one and a half wavelengths, so we might say something like L equals three halves, lambda. The bottom picture's got one, two wavelengths. So I could say L equals two lambda. And if we kind of go back up to the top picture, that would represent a wave where the length of the string is half the wavelength. And so you can kind of start to see a pattern being formed. Like if I take the middle, uh, second one down and write it as two over two lambda, and the last one down as 4 over 2 lambda, then we can kind of see a pattern emerging. And so in general, we can say that the length of the string is equal to 2 halves the wavelength of the wave that is on there. So only when the wavelength matches these conditions will there be a standing wave formed on the string. So the standing wave with the longest wavelength which will be the top one, is often referred to as the fundamental. So this guy is called the fundamental. Um, sometimes they're also referred to as the first harmonic. Harmonic meaning like a ratio series. And so we could label that as a first harmonic. Um, higher frequency waves, meaning lower wavelength, um, are often referred to by their n number, as in n in the equation we just saw, and they're labeled as like the nth harmonic. So the second one down will be the second harmonic, next one down will be the third harmonic, next one down will be the fourth harmonic. So whatever that value of n is in the previous equation, we say the nth harmonic. So we just kind of need to know those terms, be able to draw the standing wave given the harmonic number. The next thing we're going to look at is standing waves in a column of air. You may be wondering how we get a column of air and how do we confine it in place. Um, well, the trick is we use a pipe. And so when I say pipe, I mean just about anything that could be used to contain air. So things like bottles and flutes, your lungs, a trumpet, um, those are all considered pipes in the physics sense. And so we can make standing waves in a column of air just by confining it with a pipe. So some examples of this would be if you've ever blown across a bottle to make kind of that hollow whooshing sound. Uh, if you've ever played an instrument that involves air. Um, if you've ever talked, you have created a standing wave in your lungs. And having you in class, I know you've talked before. So, kind of getting into the physics of this. If the pipe is open at both its ends, then it must be an anti-node at each end in the standing wave. So if we kind of draw a pipe that's open at both ends, kind of look like that, and then the standing wave created inside of there might look something like that. So instead of the ends being tied down, like it is for a string and there having to be a node, here the ends have to be an anti-node. So if we figure out how many waves there are in this picture, there's one wave, there's a second wave, we're still going to call the whole length of the medium L, and so we can write a relationship like L equals 2 lambda. So if we kind of look at some um, other standing waves in an open pipe, they might look like this. The top one would be the fundamental. It's the shortest wavelength, or excuse me, the longest wavelength. That'll create a standing wave in that pipe. 
would call that guy the second harmonic, and that one the third harmonic. And again, the pattern here is that the length of the pipe equals n over 2 lambda. If, however, the pipe is open at one end and closed at the other end, the physics is a little bit different. Just like before, the open end has to be an antinode, but the closed end of the pipe has to be a node. So like a pipe organ would be a good example of this situation. So now our pipe looks more like this, where one end is closed, and our standing wave would now look something like that. And again, the closed end has to be a node, the open end has to be an antinode. So if we count the waves, that's one wavelength right there, and then the remainder of the wave would be just a fourth of a wavelength. Again, if we call the whole length of the pipe L, we could write something like L equals 1 and 1 fourth lambda, or we could write it like L equals 5 over 4 lambda. So pipes that are closed at one end are slightly different. In this situation, L has to be some odd number of 1 fourth wavelengths, or an odd number of quarter wavelengths. So the equation for relating the length to the wavelength is going to be slightly different. So here are some pictures of wave, standing waves in pipes which are closed at one end. The dashed line represents the part of the wave that extends beyond the pipe. The fundamental would look something like that. That would be the third harmonic, where n equals 3. And then the next one down would be the fifth harmonic. And so in general, the length of the pipe would be n over 4 lambda, where n has to be some odd number. So only odd harmonics are possible with pipes which have one end open and one end closed. And so if we kind of sketch those, which I would encourage you to sketch those in your notes, notice that there's three-fourths of a wave. And this is the one like I drew just a second ago. That distance right there would be five-fourths of a wave. So it's important that we can kind of draw what the standing wave look like, looks like um, so that we can relate the length of the medium, pipes in this case, to the wavelength of the standing wave. So standing waves are an example of something that's commonly referred to as resonance. Resonance occurs when a vibrating or oscillating system has its amplitude increased by an external force or vibration. So like one thing causes another thing to vibrate. So standing waves are an example of that. So in order for that to be true, the external vibration has to match the natural frequency of the system in order for it to cause resonance. So what does this mean by saying natural frequency? Well, let's look at a simple example. Suppose you were to take a trumpet and you were to play the middle C on a trumpet. I don't even know if trumpets can play a middle C or not. Just making this up. The frequency of the sound waves that create, are created when you play a middle C on a trumpet is 262 hertz. So here's a trumpet, and we're going to hold two tuning forks nearby. One tuning fork that's a middle C, and the other one that's a middle A. So that when you ring those things, they vibrate at different frequencies. Here are some sound waves coming from the trumpet at a frequency of 262 hertz. If you play the trumpet near these tuning forks, you're going to observe that the middle C tuning fork starts to vibrate and ring as well. So you play the trumpet, and then you stop playing the trumpet, you would notice that the middle C tuning fork is still ringing. So what happens is that waves from the trumpet cause the middle C tuning fork to ring. That's an example of resonance. External vibrations, in this case the waves from the trumpet, match the natural frequency of the middle C tuning fork, but not the other tuning fork. And so back in the 30s, there was a bridge uh, called the Tacoma Narrows Bridge that um, started to vibrate 
and oscillate back and forth because the sound created by the wind blowing through the cables match the natural frequency of the bridge and eventually cause the bridge to collapse. So we'll see if we can check out a video of this when we're in class next time. Um, but standing waves and resonance in general can be used for good, like for instance creating music, or they can be used for evil, like for destroying bridges. So till next time, ta-ta.